thank you, thank you all for coming. Welcome to the, uh, the, the afternoon seminar series. I will welcome you to the center since I think I recognize all the faces around. So you're all you're all here as, as uh, uh, members. Um, I will, however, uh, take a moment of your time to welcome back uh, Professor Vic Dillon to York University. It's a real pleasure to have you back with us. Um, uh, professor Dillon is Professor Emeritus, as you'll see, at uh, Lancaster University, but has been based throughout his career at Lancaster and yet traveled extensively, taking to a range of universities, a range of research centers around the world, most recently, and I think I'm right, still in saying this, to, uh, to Istanbul. Uh, that's the most, most recent of your um, Mixed work has been central to the development of critical social thinking in international relations, and I'm not quite sure. I don't need to tell any of you that. He began his academic work in strategic studies. Uh, some of you may even remember. No, you wouldn't. Uh, there used to be this thing called strategic studies that, that some of us used to do. Um, but he then became one of the, uh, the, the leading voices in the turn to critical social theory and international relations, particularly looking um, uh, to continental philosophy, and published one of the landmark books in the then emergent fields of critical IR, critical security studies in 1996 with his politics of security. Um, since then, he has continued to be at the forefront of thinkers bringing continental philosophy together with urgent questions of security, particularly security that focuses on life rather than on the sovereign state. Um, it's tempting, and I keep being tempted by this, to suggest that having sorted out the problem of the security of life, he's now turning to what comes next. Uh, but actually, to be perfectly honest, I, I don't know what the arc is of, uh, of his always creative and surprising thinking that led from the security of, of life to today's paper. So instead, I'll simply welcome you again and uh, invite the rest of you to enjoy with me his, oh, I'm going to get the Greek long, uh, prolegomena, close-ish, yeah. um, on the question of afterlife. Nick. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you all for coming, and thanks to Chris and David for the invitation. And uh, also for that introduction, uh, which is especially useful because it, it leads me in to tell you what's uh, coming next. Um, yeah, I'm puzzled too as to how I got from uh, uh, biopolitics to afterlife and political spirituality, which is what I'm going to talk about today. I guess it is two things. One. Uh, shamelessness of taking six or seven years to write a book on biopolitics and security which is still not finished because I got diverted into the kind of issues uh, that I'm going to be talking about today because I think that these are germane to the uh, analytic of biopolitics that I've been uh, struggling to finish um, and, and, and the second uh, uh, reason is that afterlife registers my uh, profound hostility to uh, dis dissatisfaction isn't a tough enough word uh, my profound hostility to the conception of life uh, that is the strategic uh, uh, principle of formation for biopolitics so, so when we talk life we can't presume we know what life is and when biopolitics talks life you cannot presume that it knows what life is uh, so what's at issue in biopolitics became increasingly evident to me as I worked through the apparatuses of government and technology and so on uh, that I identified as being integral to this biopolitical turn in, um, in the politics of government and rule in the West and specifically in relation to security. What's at issue is life itself, to, to, to quote a title from Nicholas Rose's book. Um, but of course we don't know what life itself is, that's the point. Yeah? So the afterlife of the title, which is the title of an essay uh, which has prompted this talk, and the essay has been written for the Millennium Journal of International Affairs, special issue coming out in a couple of months on the death of God in international relations. Afterlife is my way of signaling uh, that uh, this reflection is about well, what comes after the life of the life of biopolitics. Um, and so that, that's the linking effect, that I spent a lot of time engaging in a Foucauldian analytic of biopolitics. There are a number of analytics of biopolitics, as you know, the Gambon, Negri, and so on. But I'm preoccupied with Foucault's analytic of biopolitics. I won't make any claims for it. I just am. It seems to me the most developed one. Uh, I'm happy to argue about all the others too, but anyway. Um, 
Foucault is enough to be getting on with. Uh, proceeding from the analytic through to, well, what's at stake? What's the analytic for? And associated with that was also an increasing disenchantment with critique. Um, Rob Walker, who I'm sure you know, a, a distinguished Canadian uh, a scholar, was over, and a friend of mine was over in uh, Newcastle in UK recently. Um, and the title of his talk there was something like um, Critique, So What? You know? um, and Rob's point, which I think is well taken, uh, is that um, uh, we're very adept at critique. No, we all do critique. Uh, Biopoliticians do critique. Um, and yet, and yet, we still have apparatuses of government and rules, specifically biopolitically, uh, uh, which I think are uh, uh, threatening and, um, and, and uh, self immolating. So if you can critique them, and this is how Rob ended his talk, actually, um, it was, well, you know, I've critiqued these things to death. I know how to do the critique. Yeah, okay, so what? And I guess this move from in afterlife to political spirituality is driven by the so what. Now, at some point, this book has got to end, and I have to deliver it to Rowling. Uh, and uh, it seemed to me that that was the last chapter. So you're kind of getting, you know, the ass end of this project, really, where I have to start thinking, because that's what I'm driven by anyway, is, is after this life, one might say. Now, I'm going to give you a hybrid presentation. First of all, with apologies to Libby, I'm going to read a short section out of the paper uh, entitled After Life, which is going to come out with Millennium. Uh, I'm going to read you a short extract. It's about 1,400 words, so it'll take about 20, 20 <coughs> minutes or so. Um, then I'm going to back off because I'm taking this as an opportunity for me to look at my own program in a kind of pedagogical way for myself, uh, at least as much as for my audience, and see how this fits into the wider project of Foucault's politics of security, I'll explain what I mean by that, and very specifically biopolitics of security. Okay, so then we move to the uh, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. What was never do PowerPoint presentations on my research was do the paper. But in this instance, I think one the paper is very tight and 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 fits into that um, that milieu of the death of God, Nietzsche, and international relations. So it's hard to just pull it out and just give it to you. And the second is, uh, it's a new paper. It's a fresh paper, and the thoughts in it are derived both from a very short interview that Foucault gave to the critic Claude uh, Bonafoy back in the late 60s and the bulk of the idea comes from Foucault's lectures which I've been immersed in for some time now and very specifically the 81-82 lecture series The Hermeneutics of the Subject which is all about the relationship of the subject to truth and deals very largely with the classical period uh, the Greeks and the Romans and a kind of lead-in uh, to the Christian okay? and it's there that you get a very a very uh, a detailed, sophisticated development of the notion of spirituality and political spirituality for which he caught such shit over the Iranian Revolution when he described uh, what was going on in Tehran in 1978 as political spirituality in newspaper reports. Um, and then if you back off a little and you think about the notion of spirit and you think about Heidegger and you think about Derrida and you think about the Nazis and you think about this and that, Spirit in Europe is a heavily loaded term. Okay. So, at first I thought when I read the, uh, the reports from Tehran, I thought he was kind of going off half cocked. He wasn't. The entire, the entire lecture series, the hermeneutics of the subject, is developing the notion of spirituality. And this is where I move to in the, um, in the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so section I'm going to read is entitled Already Present Death. And my epigraph for it is taken from that interview with Claude Bonafoy where Foucault says, I only write on the basis of the other's already present death. In 68, Foucault agreed to write a series of interviews with the critic, uh, to do a series of interviews with the critic Claude uh, Bonafoy. The project was quickly abandoned but a transcript of the first interview remains actually in your bookshop. It's only just been published. Um, it'd be unremarkable 
just another small addition to the Foucault archive, if it were not for the observation that Foucault makes there about his writings, which I think affords an opportunity to recast his intellectual enterprise, which I take to be the politics of truth, in a way that opens up a novel theme of reflection upon our modern politics of truth, since the politics of truth for which Foucault, as you know, was preoccupied with the politics of truth of the present. Yeah? So even when it goes back to the Greeks and the Romans with Foucault, the object is always Kant's question from what is enlightenment, which is, what are we now? But well, Foucault gives it his own problematizing critical twist. For Foucault, there is, of course, no politics of truth, just as there is no power as such. There can only be historical instances of politics, power, and truth. I especially wish to use this reflection also to introduce and frame what Foucault had to say about the wider theme that preoccupied his later lectures in the Collège de France. Uh, that theme is the theme of spirituality in general and of political spirituality in particular. So whenever Foucault is talking about politics of truth, dispositifs, power, or forms of government and rule, he's always talking about specific, <coughs> idiomatic renditions of politics of power and rule. That seems to me to be his forte. And the ones with which he was concerned from the beginning to the end of his career were the changing rules of truth and truths of rule that constitute our present. Let me just underline that formulation, which is mine rather than Foucault's, but born out of reading Foucault, and that formulation runs right through the entire book, Biopolitics and Security, but specifically this essay, Rules of Truth and Truths of Rule. I'll be explaining a bit more about that in a moment. It's to Foucault that we also owe the fundamental insight that while truth-telling and government of self and others are different activities, they're intimately related. Government is therefore not truth, and truth is not government, but each implies the other. How? When? Where? These remain historically contingent questions concerning different veridical apparatuses, themselves inspired by different relations to the problematization of truth. So truth-telling and ruling are therefore not only separate, but also heterogeneous activities. They're subject to a logic of contingent relationality that may only ever achieve a measure of strategic coherence. Foucault has no difficulty understanding that the heterogeneous coexist. The logic of their contingent relationality is clear. There's no rule of truth that does not entail a truth of rule. Similarly, there's no truth of rule that does not invoke allied rules of truth. If the truth teller is telling the truth, the truth for everyone. And if what the truth teller says is true, then it follows that the conduct of conduct from the individual to the collective should be aligned or align itself with the truth. No truth teller proclaims the truth as pure abstraction without any implication for the conduct of conduct for himself or herself alone. And there can therefore be no truth without its corresponding governmental politics of truth. This logic of contingent relationality only ever expresses itself in a logic of strategic rather than dialectical interdependence. Since, and this is a quote from Foucault, which you don't see much used, I think, but is absolutely central to his work. Quotation, a logic of strategy does not express contradictory terms within a homogeneity that promises their resolution in a unity. The function of strategic logic is to establish the possible connections between disparate terms which remain disparate. The logic of strategy is the logic of connections between the heterogeneous and not the logic of the homogenization of the contradictory. Thus truth and rule, heterogeneous, different, but related. This truth and rule remain implicated in what I call a mutually disclosive belonging together in the relationship of strategic rather than dialectical interdependence. It is the very idiomaticity of politics, power and truth that accounts for the specific ways in which they operate together at any one time. Rules of truth and truths of rule circumscribe the semantic fields through which we make sense and the fields of formation, intervention, problematization that circumscribe the modes of being of our historically situated being in the world. Within their circumference, what Foucault also calls points of emergence, points of application, 
and surfaces of friction. All terms of art in Foucault always also arise. Rules of truth, truths of rule, are only ever fixed in retrospect and by those concerned with discovering periods and epochs. In their own times, they're always contested and changing and problematic. Contingent and provisional, not only temporal, taking place in time, but also temporary. They end and they're changed into something else. And those, those junctures are vitally important to an argument I make elsewhere, though it's part of this project, about the eschatological impulse that's there within modern politics of security. As ever with Foucault, it is, however, dangerous to presume that one already knows what terms mean and to what use Foucault is putting them. A fortiori, one cannot therefore presume to know what Foucault meant to interrogate by spirituality, in general, or political spirituality in particular. You can take it for granted that he's not meaning something that is confined to religion and he's not merely referencing something that finds its expression in forms of mysticism. Okay? You can take that for granted. What it is, we'll come to. Neither is the relation of political spirituality to the history and politics of truth, including Foucault's allied understandings of critique and freedom, transparent. In respect to spirituality especially, Foucault is insistent that it arises in respect of a certain relationship to the truth of the self or the subject to the truth and he distinguishes that from the modern period in which you have a relation of the subject to knowledge. And he draws a fundamental distinction there between truth and knowledge. We'll come to that later. One thing can however be said with reasonable confidence as the 1980s lectures witnessed the topic of spirituality was no digression for Foucault. And despite the novelty of his adventure into journalism with the Iranian reports, and despite being comprehensively travestied by the Afare and Anderson book on Foucault and the Iranian Revolution, the Iranian reports were entirely consistent with Foucault's wider intellectual interests and projects. Spirituality became increasingly central to the ways in which Foucault pursued his concern with history and the politics of truth from his critical studies of discipline, normalization, power and knowledge, governmentalization, biopoliticization into an extensive exploration of the care of the self, government and resistance, and freedom, in which he was widely engaged when he died. The funny thing about the late Foucault is he didn't know it was going to be late. <laughs> what he was working on when he died was very much actuel, you know. Uh, there is no late Foucault in the sense of him having achieved a sub-final end point. Paul Foucault didn't know he was going to die, so it just stopped. But you can't see the project and the trajectory of work and research and reflection he was on. Foucault said many things about his work, many of which were inconsistent and deliberately designed to avoid being labelled. So what did he say to Claude Bonafoy that was any different? I'll skip that bit. First, he didn't talk about what he had written, but about his relation to writing. It's a theme in Foucault about his relation to writing. I can't elaborate on that now, but it's, it's quite interesting. Second, he typified himself in a strikingly new way. And third, whether or not this typification reveals the final truth of Foucault is not the issue. There is, of course, no such final truth to be had, and it's vain to search for one. Neither is that the way in which I relate to Foucault and other thinkers. The thinker is never in possession of the thought. The thought is not their property. It's no one's property. One's relation to the thought, then, as a co-thinker, is a matter of what St. Francis of Assisi would have called the usufruct to be had in it, the use to be made of it. That's your own responsibility to think. When this observation is applied less to what Foucault has written, therefore, than to the subjects and objects about which he wrote, most especially the twin strategic figures of man and life, our currently prevailing rules of truth and truths of rule get said in a revealingly different way. Hence, Foucault did not say what I'm about to say about our modern politics of truth, its rules of truth and truths of rule. I don't think that matters. Given how he describes himself to Bonifoy, what I'm about to say not only becomes possible to say, it seems to me that it becomes so compellingly self-evident that paradoxically it has to be said Otherwise, it would escape being said at all. Now we'll go to the interview. 
<coughs> quote, for me, Foucault says in reply to Bonafoy, for me, writing means having to deal with the death of others. But it basically means having to deal with others to the extent that they are already dead. I'm in the situation of the anatomist, his dad was a surgeon, remember, who performs an autopsy. If for Foucault, the alternative, and I'm quoting him now, if for Foucault, the alternative to death isn't life, but truth. If then, as he also observed in his view, what we have to rediscover through the whiteness and inertia of death isn't the lost shudder of life, but the meticulous deployment of truth, after death retains its mystery. But death itself always serves as the point of emergence for rules of truth and point of application for truth to rule. And remember that if biopolitics about making life live, do not forget that it's concerned with the construal of the life-death nexus. You never get life without death of some form. And here's the key point. Foucault says, they feel there is something in it, in his writings, that condemns them to death. He's taking a piss, but there's a point here. And he clarifies. In fact, I'm much more naive than that. I don't condemn them to death. I simply assume they're already dead. That's why I'm so surprised when I hear them cry out and complain. I'm astonished, as astonished as the anatomist who suddenly becomes aware that the man on whom he's intended to demonstrate his skills has woken up beneath the scalpel. Suddenly his eyes open, his mouth starts to scream, his body twists, and the anatomist steps back and his caress is shot. Hey, he wasn't dead. He then explains that this so-called postmodern irony is in fact an expression of his astonishment that the already dead scream out in the middle of their living autopsies. In short, he says, I don't claim to kill others in my writing. I only write on the basis of the others already present death. When I read that, I just couldn't let go of it. Okay, what follows comes from riffing on this Foucauldian observation about the modern people and authors that he writes about as, in some sense, already dead. None of this means the corpses do not in some way also carry on living. <coughs> Indeed, carry on living by the very dying that Foucault, the pathologist of the living dead, seeks to diagnose. That resonant expression, already present death, nails the point. Foucault's modern subjects are living subjects revealed here to be more than the subjects of their own processes of performatively enacted self-subjection. Processes of subjection preoccupying the reception and application of Foucault's work for decades. For sub such subjects live the life of the already present death. A living death whose pathologies Foucault's work exposes Modern subjects, the living dead, whose autopsies Foucault tries to conduct. In other words, I'm riffing off that expression to make the observation that in some sense the life of modern politics is a life of living death. That then is why Foucault's work continues to excite such deep-seated and outraged fear. For if Foucault is correct, he appears, at least in this guise, to have already written us off. But that would be entirely to discount what he so insistently says about freedom, critique, care of the self, spirituality, and truth-telling, and the courage of truth, that so enlivens the modern condition against the currently prevailing truths of rule and rules of truth assembled through the figures of man and life, whose existence, I'm saying, is the existence of living death. Now, I make a great play in the, in the paper about finitude, life, death, and so on in the modern period, in which death is a kind of groundwork for modern man and life. I won't go into that now. Can do in discussion. If Foucault's works are autopsies, then everything he wrote about was already in some sense dead. The living death of already present death. But what death is it that takes place here? Since, most importantly, those dead include the already present dead of the living, for whose history and ontology for whose very analytic infinitude, to use an expression from the order of things, Foucault persistently called. His political subjects especially are curiously thus living dead. Theirs is the living death of the rules of truth, the truth of rule of the current construal of their factical finitude. Later, I'm going to explain what I mean by factical finitude 
by drawing a distinction between factical finitude and soteriological finitude. Okay, so that's the excerpt from the paper. So, how long did that take? What time have we got now, Dave? Uh, it's two o'clock. Two so o'clock. That so that took just about <coughs> two seconds. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Always never does. Okay. So that's the excerpt, okay? I'm setting up by riffing off that observation. It's a throwaway. He's actually talking to Bonafoy at that time about the experience of his home background, of his father, who was a surgeon, of, the, of his own sensibility to corporeality and so on and so forth. But I just couldn't let go of that notion of the already present death as, a, as, as offering a motif for characterizing the life of biopolitics. Okay? Already present death in the sense that the life of biopolitics is itself something that is assigned to the securing, the endangering, the governmentality of biopolitics. There's something missing here. So I began to get a sense of the source of what it was, that uh, uh, the source of my dissatisfaction and profound hostility to the life of biopolitics. Because the life of biopolitics is the life of the living dead. That was the, that was the insight I had when I was reading it. Hence, afterlife. Okay. And then, let me use this epigraph to set this up. This is from Heidegger's lectures on Parmenides. Everything anti thinks in the spirit of death against which it is anti. All right, so I've introduced also the notion of spirituality. This quotation from Heidegger, which I've had in my notebooks for a very long time, it kind of happens like that. The older you get, you know, you accrue quotations that you think are useful, but you never know when they're going to be able to get deployed and do some work for you. Suddenly this one does, okay? Of course, spirit, yeah? Everything anti thinks in the spirit of that against which it is anti. I'm anti-biopolitics. So what do I have to do? I have to interrogate the spirit of biopolitics, okay? So I'm beginning to think that where one moves from critique to something else is where one engages the spirit of biopolitics and not merely a critical engagement with its rules of truth and its truth of rule, okay? I've got to triangulate it somehow by getting to this idea of spirit, I mean, or spiritless, as Foucault will actually uh, describe it. But there is an ethos. If you're unhappy with the term spirit because of its profound religious uh, connotations and synonyms, Ethos, the ascetic, the ascesis in Greek, it's the practice or mode of existence. Yeah? Okay. So you've got to get with an engagement of its mode of existence and not simply its veridical apparatuses, its modes of truth telling, and its governmental apparatuses, its modes of operationalizing truth in terms of governmental. Uh, regulation, okay? Yes, you've got to do that, and I've engaged with that, you'll see in a moment, but this this is a kind of triangulation of this, this, this third element has got to be the last chapter of the book, okay? That's where it's got to finish. Because that's the wherefore and the why. Now, this is all based upon the lecture series, the hermeneutics of the subject. And excuse the length of the quotation. The heart of the project, Foucault says, this is just to nail my general observation that Foucault's project is the politics of truth, by which I mean, as he does, the relationship between truth and rule. Okay, the one that I outlined in that excerpt. You know, for every for every uh, uh, rule of truth, there's going to be a truth of rule, and for every truth of rule, there's going to be a rule of truth. These two things are indissociable. Truth tellers and the project of truth is one thing. Government. And the project of governing is another thing, but they are intimately related. They're heterogeneous. Yeah? They're not the same. They don't have to be the same. They can be separate. They can be disparate. But they will be strategically related. I would argue that the theorization of politics should always focus upon that strategic relationship. But that's another, that's another book about what the study of political theory ought to be about, rather than great names, great thinkers. It should be focused on the relationship between truth and rule. That is where politics takes place, in the way that I would think about politics. Okay. So this is where he basically says it. It's actually, it's, it's laid on in uh, the hermeneutics of the subject. I forgot what lecture. It doesn't matter. 
The heart of the project I want to pose this year, he says, is how is the relationship between truth-telling, he uses this word veridiction, and I, I've turned it into veridical apparatuses. He says, I think it does a lot of powerful work at summarising. The truth is, just, is not simply a matter of standing up and saying, this is true, but truth-telling is a complex process of deciding what's true, what's false, and how this is to be circulated, and how it's to be demonstrated, and who can say it, and who cannot say it, and when it's supposed to be said. Okay? It's an apparatus. So there are veridical dispositives, just as there are governmental dispositives. How is the relationship between truth-telling? The funny thing about truth, and I discovered this when I was teaching in Istanbul um, uh, uh, to a bunch of uh, uh, Muslim uh, students, um, and I was teaching a course on political theory, but actually I was teaching myself, and I, they were more interested in me than they were in the texts on political theory that I was teaching. And quite rightly so. I was a strange creature. They'd never encountered somebody like me before with a particular kind of theoretical, philosophical, intellectual background and Western background. I had never encountered people like them before. These were uh, dedicated, uh, committed uh, 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 Muslim students, Islamic, uh, 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 committed to the Islamic faith and so on. And um, I hadn't realised the extent to which uh, it, these apparatuses of, of, of truth-telling where so it's, it's a kind of obvious point even in religion where it's so developed that is to say there is no truth without its mode of mediation that's why there has to be an apparatus and I got this point because we were talking one day in class and the point suddenly hit me I mean, God spoke to man the truth isn't just simply there in any unmediated fashion, even within the biblical texts and even within the Abrahamic tradition, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. There's always a mediation. You cannot have truth without mediation. Somebody has to tell you. It has to be said. It has to come through language, sign, symbol, or the book. Then the minute you've got the mediation, you've got the emergence of the apparatus. Yeah? So, veridical apparatus, not just an unmediated truth. Oh, that's the truth. It's God spoke to man. Already, you've got communication here. All right? Already, you've got an apparatus. Okay. How is the relationship between truth telling, benediction, veridical apparatuses, and the practice of the subject, the constitution of the subject in receipt of the truth? What's the apparatus working on? Well, it's working on the tradition of truth telling. But it's working on the subject in receipt of the tradition, inhabiting the tradition, interrogating the tradition, receiving it, interpreting it hermeneutically, and passing it on. You've got an apparatus here. This is a complicated apparatus. Yeah? This is no unmediated passing on of the truth. It never was. And I would argue, how could it not be anything but an apparatus? Okay. And the constitution of those who are in the truth, as Heidegger says, yeah? in the truth, inhabiting a tradition, a way of being, an ethos, a set of practices, a form of life. There is no form of life without its veridical apparatuses. There is no form of life without its governmental apparatuses. So this is Foucault's, this is what I learned from Foucault, I mean I'm just repeating for you. Or, more generally, and underlined for emphasis, by me, how are truth telling and government, governing oneself and others? It arises with uh, initially in Foucault here when he's, he's in, interrogating the dialogue with Alcibiades and Socrates. Uh, it's about governing oneself and governing others. How is this linked and how are they connected to one another? Okay. But maybe. And maybe don't even need to emphasise this, but actually having done this to the Foucauldian ordinances who un understand their version of Foucault, and me saying this is the you know, Foucault is about the politics of truth. No, 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 it's not. It's about power, it's about this, about that. No. He, the boy says it. This is his project. This is a big project. But this is the central project. Now, this is the triangulation. This is me teaching myself by expressing this to you. You have to stand back from my project and say, ah, 
Okay, it's this bottom bit I've got to. Okay, politics of truth, what is it about? It's about the rules of truth and the truth of rule. It's about the relationship between veridical apparatuses. We say that this is the truth, but how do you operationalize the truth? Through rule. This is also about governmental apparatuses, but what, is, what, what do governmental apparatuses appeal to? And the answer is they invoke truth. Think of realism in international relations. It's a faith. So, rules of truth, truth of rule, veridical apparatuses, linked to governmental apparatuses. Fine. That much was clear to me until I finished this paper and then and read my way through the hermeneutics of the subject. There's something else going on. Uh, there's an ethos. There's the form of life itself. There is that which arises out of that complicated strategic interrelationship between truth and rule, rule and truth, that constitutes a form of life, an ethos, the Greek word for it is ascesis, a set of practices, a say of being in the world, a form of spirituality in Foucault's terms. Or, just for symmetry, political apparatuses, governmental apparatuses, aesthetic apparatuses. You've got to have all three. And I think my engagement critically with biopolitics, I'll show you about rules of truth in a minute, uh, the governmental apparatuses, I've done a lot of work on that. I've done almost nothing on the form. Everything in relation to my engagement of biopolitics of truth in relation to the form of life it institutes has been purely intuitive, purely repulsion, purely um, kind of hatred of it, yeah? fueling, fueling the top two circles, but not directly addressing uh, how does one engage the aesthetic here, the form of life, yeah? which is also an aesthetic of a sort. And I've now got a name for the aesthetic of biopolitics, and the name for it is living death. Oh, let me just go back there. Uh, this is, well, this is from Foucault. Yeah? I think the philosophical esquisis should be understood as a certain way of constituting the subject of true knowledge as a subject of right action. Rules of truth, truth of rule. Okay, rules of truth? Well, you know. Rules of truth are your conditions of possibility. They are those functional presuppositions and assumptions that you make that enable you to do stuff. Orient yourself in the world. Those fundaments to which you appeal. Those ontological presuppositions or conditions. Those statements which effectively say, this is the nature of the real however you want to say what the real is. But this is the nature of the real. Functional ontological presuppositions. The world is round. The world is flat. The world was created by a providential, loving God. Or the world just came out of some kind of chemical interaction and soup. Yeah. I'm not really interested in what they are. I'm only interested. I'm not interested in the formal propositions about which may be true and which may be false. I'm interested in what happens when you have these sets of assumptions and you build on them. Okay? Because I'm a theorist of politics. I'm engaged in an analytic here, not a formal Kantian or other philosophical. How do we know what's true and what's false? Okay, from that point of view, I'm an agnostic. Huh? I, I don't know about that for the moment. Yeah, I think I do, but I don't want to go into that at the moment. What I do know about is you have these truths, you'll have some kind of government. So I'm interested in the kind of government you've got if you have these kind of truths, and I'm interested in the kind of truths that governments involve. Okay, That's, I reckon, my game. Okay, I think it's a neglected game. I think that the living death of biopolitics is one that actually prevents us asking about that. So you, rules of truth come into forms of veridical apparatuses. These aren't simple things, they're complicated things, they're long, hermeneutical, well-established traditions in which so much is taken for granted that we don't realise how much we've taken for granted. Key point is, for me, that this takes place in a statement about the truth of space and time, of the taking place of existence as such. Now the key move, Foucault calls it the Copernican turn, but a key move is a shift in Western understandings of time, Western understandings of human beings' location in the world. It's the shift from 
a providentially created universe by a, uh, a, a monotheistic deity that remains interested in the future and working out of that universe and has a plan for it. Okay? I'm going to call that soteriological finitude. Okay? Christians, you live and you die. Moderns, you live and you die. Okay? The business of finitude isn't the point of difference between the pre-modern and the modern. Pre-moderns know you die. Moderns know you die. The point is, is how you die or how the finitude is defined and problematized. That's the difference. Within the Christian tradition in the West, okay, you live and you die in order to try to achieve eternal life. There's an order to this thing, there's an order to creation, and there is a promise. So teleological is just a posh word for salvation, redemption, okay? So the finitude is indexed to salvation, and the political economy you're engaged in is a political economy of salvation. And the goal is eternal life. Note, life here is on probation. The Latin word probatio is Latin for test. And the idea that life is a test goes right back to the Stoics and the Greeks. So there's nothing new about life being understood to be a test, under constant testing. Those of us who come from the British Academy know all about that. <laughs> right? There's nothing new about that. It's how it's done that differs. Yeah? Okay. So life is a test. You're on probation. Life is on probation. You could ask the question, for what? Is it on probation? Now, within the Christian tradition, they worked it out very well. Life is on probation for, in order to earn the tenure of eternal life. Since Libby just got tenure. <laughs> yeah? So you're on probation for tenure. But the tenure here is eternal life. Why? Because life is understood to be, as you'll see in a moment, sub specie eternitatis, as St. Augusta would say. Eternal life. Okay? Life is eternal. Now, eternal life can either be spent in hell or it can be spent in heaven, but it's eternal. Modern finitude isn't anything like that. Modern finitude, after Leibniz in particular, is, uh, is ad infinitum. There is no plan. There is no eternal life. There are only calculations to infinity. And those calculations to infinity matter as much in language, as much as they do in mathematics, as much as they do in politics. There is no end. There is only the possibility of calculating the specificity and the particularity and the definitive features of and properties of things through calculations to infinity. Okay, so this is factical finitude. Factical and facticity is a term of art from continental philosophy, and I haven't the time to go into it, but essentially it basically says that we are creatures who, 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 are, who live and die, but, but the business of life and death is ad infinitum. It doesn't end in any apocalypse. It doesn't end in any fulfillment of divine promise. It's just calculations to infinity. And Leibniz introduced calculus, and calculus is the form of mathematics which is calculus to infinity. Infinity is a function. Yeah? It isn't just like something... It's a function for working out the specificity of particular properties, of instances of occurrences of events or things in the world that you can calculate in terms of referencing them to infinity. They're different from the, the infinite. How are they different from uh, the infinite? That's the calculation to infinity. They're different because they're this, 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 and this. Okay. This is the analytic affinitude that Foucault is intensely, is intensely concerned with in a much neglected text, The Order of Things. It's much neglected because it's a bugger of a book to read. It's a hard book. Huh? But it's a major, it's a major piece of, uh, of, of reflection in philosophy. And the last, no, the penultimate chapter, Man and His Doubles, is the key. Yeah? And it's in Man and His Doubles that Foucault talks about the analytic affinitude and the modern problematic of giving what Foucault calls concrete form to finitude. Because finitude is infinite and indefinite. It goes on forever. It's not, it's not. 
ever in subspecie eternitatis, eternal life, it just is an infinite extension, res extensa, forever. Okay? So how do you give concrete form to particular instances of it? That is the modern project. And I would say that's the modern political project, giving concrete political form to finitude. God did not ordain a particular hierarchy and order to the world specifying who should rule and who should not rule according to what kinds of rules of truth. This does not obtain in the modern period. In the, so you could read off the rules of truth and the truths of rule and you could figure out what the political problematic was within the Christian dispensation because you have an order to things of that kind, hierarchical, created, providential. Incarnation, the Christ event, and so on and so forth. Okay, So you could read off the properties of rule just as you could read off the properties of truth. This is not given to the modern. That's the difference between modernization and pre-modernization. Okay. So, you've got to have something else to name it with, and that's my name for it is Factical Finitude. A note on finitude, okay? We're talking about the life-death nexus. Even in biopolitics, we're talking about the life-death nexus. It's problematization in Foucauldian terms. How you problematize the life-death nexus? Do you problematize it as one that is uh, a, a, that has a fundamental rift between life and death? And when you move from life through death, you get to eternal life, or do you just have life and death ad infinitum? Makes a difference. So soteriological finitude is dealing with us as creatures suspecia eternitatis, as to say, capable of eternal life. Or factical finitude, which is subspecie ad infinitum. Res excessa. Calculations to infinity. Now, that, that is, to go back to my earlier point, the rules of truth obtaining in factical finitude are rules of truth that are quite different from those obtaining in soteriological finitude. So the rules of truth of modernity are associated with factical finitude. That's its fundamental, as it were, ground zero. Calculations to infinity. It's only when I'd read that and worked that out in the order of things that I realised that my book was going to be another two years late. Because <laughs> kind of factoring that into, you could see that I'm using Foucault. This is this is both exegesis of Foucault, but it's a utilisation of Foucault. Well, an exegesis is relatively easy, but if you want to use him as well, then you've got work to do of your own. Okay. And when I came across giving concrete form to finitude, and I came across practical finitude, I knew I was in trouble. That's to say I had at least another year or two of work to do, and um, you'll see me at the end of that period. Truths of rule, they're easy, yeah? The, all truth has to be operationalised. The truth isn't just for me, it's for you. The truth isn't just to admire, it's to be lived in and lived by. You've got to operationalise it. <laughs> if, if we to go back, if we call rules of truth here... If we call them metaphysics, yeah? Well, metaphysics has to have its mechanics. You've got to put it to work. And you put it to work through governmental apparatuses as well, yeah? And the intersection between the two, of course, there's you know, schools, universities, at the point where these two things collide and meet. Uh, okay, so if rules of truth are to do with conditions of possibility, one presumes that the world is this way, this possibilizes then a whole form of life. But to operationalize it requires rules. Now, Agamben takes the Christian term oconomia, which is to do with the household, but he's taken that from economy, I think, in the way that the economy figures in Foucault, as the operationalization of rules of truth. You need the mechanics. See, I went to a good Catholic school, and I know all about this, because I was told by Irish Christian brothers. That they, boy, could they handle economia. Yeah? Usually, at the end of this leather strap, but you know, that was part of the part of the uh, governmental apparatus. These are governmental apparatuses, and Foucault deals with them in great detail when you're talking about the governmental apparatuses that deal with the reference object of government as life, because life is different from man. Okay, man is this figure that is subject to political anthropology, analysing what the properties of man are. Yeah? 
That's one game. Thomas Hobbs. Man, nasty life, nasty brutal short, uh, continuous competition, uh, exposed to death at the hands of other men. You know, this is a political anthropology. Fine. That is part of the Western tradition in the modern period, is that its politics is derived from a political anthropology of this figure called man. But right from the very beginning, this figure called man was never sufficient for modern government and modern rule to figure out how it was going to govern and rule. Right from, and this is where I, my own research kind of modifies Foucault, right from the 17th century onwards, the business of population, the business of, of, of you can't call it biology, in effect, that, that, well, you can call it natural Natural philosophy is probably what it was called, rather than biology. You didn't get called biology till late 18th, early 19th century. But reference was made right from the beginning in the mid late late 17th century by rulers who needed to govern and rule, referencing not simply the figure of man, which is succeeding, as you know, the figure of God, and is really just God's afterlife, uh, but referencing population. In 1688, uh, when the Dutch William of Orange uh, was given the crown in, in England and then went and conquered uh, Ireland, um, he conquered Ireland and what did he do? He asked people to go over and count the people. He got some crude statisticians who'd been spending their time uh, drawing up mortality tables in London uh, and venereal disease tables in London and he asked them to go over it's a county down in Northern Ireland, and do a population survey. Why? Because he didn't know what he'd got. Conquered the place, but he didn't know what he'd got. He didn't know how many people there were. He didn't know who owned what. He didn't know what the mortality rates were. He didn't know the, the, the wealth or the, or the health of the population. There was this very famous um, survey that was done called the Down Survey. And you know what? These kind of things were being done in the North American colonies in the late 17th century as well. And this is before we get to Foucault and the 18th century, where Foucault is talking about them being done in France. Okay, so 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 biopolitics emerges at exactly the same time as the geopolitics of man. Man was never sufficient as a strategic reference point for politics in the modern age. Man and life always came together. Okay, so they were intimately connected throughout the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries. I think, I think in fact now life is kind. Of Life is, is the dominant figure. The subject of truth. David, how, how long have I got now? Um, it's, 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 you've been about 50 minutes. About 50 minutes. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll rush now. Um, this is when we begin to set up this business of spirituality. It's taken me a while to figure out what Foucault is saying. It's very, it's, you've, got to, you've got to watch him and you've got to follow him very carefully. Okay. I think I need to read these two quotations to set up what he means by spirituality and why spirituality does not, for Foucault, exist in the modern period. But why it might be possible to introduce spirituality with another move, drawing on Foucault's The Courage of Truth, Paresia. Okay, the pre-modern subject of truth, that is to say, what was assumed about the subject of truth in the pre-modern period? What was distinctive about it? And why was it spiritual in Foucault's terms? You know, not sitting on a pillar of salt in the middle of the desert contemplating the universe, yeah? The mystical kind of Christian thing, not that. This is something to do with the structure of the subject itself, the subject of truth in the pre-modern period. Spirituality here postulates that the subject as such does not have right of access to the truth and is not capable of having access to the truth, okay? It postulates that the truth is not given to the subject by a simple act of knowledge. Doing mathematical calculation, observing things through a telescope, whatever. Which would be founded and justified simply by the fact that he is the subject and because he possesses this or that structure of subjectivity. Now, spirituality here, the spirituality of the pre-modern subject, postulates that for the subject to have right of access to the truth, he must be changed. The truth is only given to the subject at a price. You've got to earn it. And that price brings the subject's entire being into question and transformation. 
That's, this is the structure of the pre-modern subject in relation to truth. The truth is not transparent to and is not for the subject as a matter of right. Truth, in a sense, is opaque to the pre-modern subject. And access to the truth can only be acquired by subjecting yourself to certain practices that open you up to the possibility of the truth. And when you receive the truth, you are transformed in yourself as a subject. That's, a pre that's spirituality. Spirituality of the pra practices that you pursue and that you perform upon yourself to open yourself up to the truth, which truth is not yours as a matter of right and is not, is not immediately transparent to you. Spirituality of the practices you undergo to make yourself or to allow yourself to become in receipt of a truth and secondly, for that truth to transform your being. It's not pedagogy, it's not education, it's not research training, <laughs> it is not skills based. Eh? It's a praxis, it's an ascesis, it's a way of life, it's an ethos. But it's something that you don't, as it were, pick and choose when you follow it and you get access of some degree and reception to the truth that changes your very being. That's the pre modern and the subject. It's relation to truth, the nature of truth, it's opaque to the subject, it has to be worked for, you've got to pay a price for it. When you pay the price, it will transform you. You will not be the same person that you were. I realised when I was teaching that I used to say more or less the same thing to my students. If you've left this classroom without me having had an impact on you, I've failed. <laughs> but I didn't realise, I hadn't read the hermeneutics of the subject then. Okay, there's a pedagogy of a sort in this. Yeah? Okay, the modern subject of knowledge. So truth in the modern period becomes something else. It becomes knowledge. It becomes a set of techniques. It becomes a set of... It, it, you've, got, you've got to acquire those techniques and so on and so forth, but a transformation in the very nature of your composition as a self is not required. You can learn them. You can go to school. You can get them from textbooks. You can go in the lab. But it is not assumed that these will change your very constitution as a self. I think it does, actually. I kind of disagree with Foucault. I think it turns you into the living dead. But anyway, here we go. The subject, it's, it's, you can see, for those of you who know anything about the Reformation and the Protestant Reformation, particularly, the Protestant, particularly Luther and the kind of catchword of Lutherism from the 17th century, which was sola fides, by faith alone. Yeah. So the, the rupture with Rome, the disengagement from the veridical apparatus of the papacy, as well as the governmental apparatus of the papacy, which rupture, dual rupture, veridical and governmental, of course, is what the Reformation was about. That rupture, one of its slogans, so to speak, fueling it, was sola fides. You don't need to go through the church. Faith alone. And the text. Read the Bible yourself. And faith alone will gain you salvation. Yeah. Now, there's a curious Protestant echo for a good Catholic boy. There's a kind of Protestant echo here in, 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 in what Foucault says about, about the shift in the Copernican shift in the modern period to being the subject of knowledge, that you can do this by knowledge alone. You don't have to undergo this curious kind of... Uh, it's not even an apprenticeship. There's this ascetic set of practices which will transform you as you perceive the truth. Here it's different. We can say that we enter the modern age when it's assumed that what gives access to the truth, the condition for the subject's access to the truth is knowledge, connaissance. And knowledge alone, I think the modern age of the history of the truth begins when knowledge itself and knowledge alone gives access to the truth. That is to say, it's when, philosopher, when the philosopher or the scientist or simply someone who's seeking the truth can recognize the truth and have access to it in himself and through acts of knowledge alone without anything else being demanded of him and without his having to alter or change in any way his being as a subject. Okay, there's a lot perhaps to discuss and maybe even to dispute there, but this, this, this is the distinction Foucault draws so that he is then able to say that in the modern period there is no spirituality. Why? Because the modern subject is presumed to be able to access the truth 
via knowledge is a matter of right, and that through knowledge and the practices of knowledge, truth becomes transparent. And you can do that through technical proficiency rather than spiritual transformation. That's the distinction he draws. So that both tells you what he means by spirituality, the set of practices in the context of an understanding of truth of this sort, and in the context of an understanding of the subject of truth of this sort, that spirituality are the practices that you follow. And you haven't got them in the modern age because you haven't got truth in that sense. You've got knowledge and you haven't got the subject in that sense. Eh? You've got the subject of knowledge. And then knowledge becomes the mechanism by which the subject gets governed. Power knowledge. And then I was telling David about the, the last couple of sentences, but it's actually only one sentence in lecture one of the hermeneutics of the subject, where Foucault just so condensely says what the whole of the next 400 pages are about. And then I haven't put it in here, but this is literally the end of the lecture. First lecture, first hour, and then he says after this, I'll read it in a minute. It's a very dense passage, but it nails it. And he says at the end, okay, that's enough for now. Let's be back in five minutes. <laughs> you know, and he's just hit you with the entire project. If we define spirituality as being the form of practices which postulate that, such as he is, the subject is not capable of the truth. But that, such as it is, the truth can transfigure and save the subject. Then we can say that the modern age of relations between the subject and truth begins when it is postulated that, such as he is, the subject is capable of the truth, but that, such as it is, the truth, brackets, knowledge, cannot save the subject. You can do stuff with it, <laughs> but it's not going to transform you spiritually. Yeah? That's what the entire 450 pages of the collective course is about. And it's that manoeuvre that allows you then to realise when he's talking about spirituality, he's not talking about religious mysticism, he's not talking about religion, although that's a great expression of spirituality. Michel de Certeau has a wonderful book uh, analysing uh, Christian mysticism in the medieval period called uh, um, Mystic Fable. He's a contemporary of Foucault, they didn't get on. But, but that's another expression of spirituality, but as Foucault is providing an analytic of spirituality, how it functions within the context of relations between a certain understanding of the truth and a certain understanding of the subject, this is what he means, okay? So that there isn't spirituality in the modern age. All right, so if there isn't spirituality in the modern age, what is the form of life of the modern age? Living death. That was why I got so excited by the Bonifoy uh, interview, because it gave me a kind of, it gave me a label for, 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 for uh, nominating what what the form of life was when it was losing, when it's lost this spirituality. Life is on test. It's on probation. Modern aesthetics. Now, this is me. Okay. Modern aesthetics. What does it become in via politics? Well, infinite civility to indefinite government. Ad infinitum. That's what human being is for biopolitics. And that's what it demands of human being. Life is infinite civility to indefinite, indefinite government. Life is construed as material that has to be rendered continuously governable. And it's indefinite because there's no particular one best way of governing. That biopolitics is learned. There's no one best way of governing. It's a constant process of determining how life is to be governed in these different changing circumstances of life, which biopolitics itself is partly, largely responsible for introducing. So it's a project of infinite civility to indefinite government, because if you reject it, if you resist it, if your life is a form of life that doesn't fit life as life is understood here, then you're meat for biopolitics. And you could do that racially, as he, as he talks about at the end of uh, society must be defended. You could do it in all sorts of ways. But you're wasted. If your form of life does not, is not amenable to this form of government. If your form of life is one that says, no, I'm not going to be infinitely servile 
to indefinite forms of government, then you're in trouble. It also struck me that there might be a way of interpreting terror and interpreting Islamic terror in terms of the understanding of truth and the rules of truth and the subject of truth here as those practices you have to undergo in order to be in receipt of truth that offer a different interpretation of, of terror than those to which we are uh, used to. Final point, I'll, I'll finish now, I've, I've run over, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Foucault has a lecture series called uh, The Courage of Truth, which is follows right through this Greek term paresia into the Christian period and beyond. Not quite beyond. He doesn't think, like spirituality, he doesn't think paresia really can exist in the modern world. But I wonder. So I wonder if there is a spirituality called the courage of truth that might be applicable here in relation to uh, one's relation to truth in the modern age. Now, that, this, is, this is either a gloss on the last chapter of my book or it's another book. But I think there is something here in the courage of truth, the idea of the courage of truth and one's relation to the pursuit of truth, even when one is not committed to a specific definitive account of truth that is politically significant and politically important here and introduces a relationship to government other than that of uh, infinite civility to indefinite government. And there will be a politicization, as it were, of one's relation to how one is governed. Eh? So it's not revolution in the sense of overthrow, although one has to say, going back to political spirituality, we're talking revolution, we're talking violence here, there's no point in, in getting around it, uh, and, and that's why he ran into trouble when he used the term about the insurrections in uh, Iran in 1978. He wasn't actually talking revolution. He has to make a distinction between an insurrection and a revolution, which, of course, is different also from the instantiation of a regime. And one can't, I think, can't help but think how prescient he was when one looks at what's been going on in the Middle East uh, and the Arab world in the last, in the last three or four years. Eh? Insurrection, insurrection, insurrection. Maybe failures of revolution, uh, actually, and certainly uh, real problematics in relation to the institution of new regimes. But you're seeing insurrection here. You're seeing people just standing up and saying, no. Because there is not just the business of government, there's also the business of saying no to government. And saying no to government is a dangerous business. One way or another. The stakes can be higher depending on the nature of the government on saying no to. But I'm, 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 we'll leave it at this. I'm curious about whether or not Paresia could be worked, whether I could work Paresia into the idea of a form of political spirituality in the modern age. Which is both, all this is both national and international. I did say I was going to end there, didn't I? But this is just a quote from him which points out that he's talking about both national and international politics. You know, he never, he never directly addresses himself. But if you look at this last this last couple of lines about the relationship of self to truth, you know, typical of Western experience, of the subject's experience of himself in the West, but also of the experience the Western subject may have or create of others. That's international politics. Yeah? We don't have to, un un yeah, he doesn't have to unpack it and go teach international relations. You know? uh, he's perfectly aware of that one's relation to truth and one's conduct as a subject of truth has an impact both locally and globally. Thank you. Excuse me for being so over long. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, and I, I'm delighted that you didn't finish with uh, government to infinity because I have to say I, I was born to infinity as I was uh, the, all I could think of was that line from uh, 1984, imagine a boot stomping on your face forever. Uh, I don't know where we get with the possibility of a, of a politics flowing from it, but I'm glad that you're thinking uh, about that. Um, 